Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. Americans may be more divided now than ever before, at least along traditional political lines. We don't seem to like our politicians much, and yet we keep electing them. Polling from Pew Research shows 60% of Americans disapprove of the job President Joe Biden is doing, and 63% hold an unfavorable view of Donald Trump. And yet, at this early stage in the 2024 primary presidential contest, both men appear poised to once again walk away with their party's nominations and face off against one another in a bitter rematch of the most divisive presidential election our country has ever seen. One group thinks they can inject a different ingredient into that grudge match. Joining me now is former Congressman Joe Cunningham, a one-term South Carolina Democrat who says, quote, Democrats are failing to offer an alternative that appeals to the majority of voters. Congressman, good to have you with us. Who should be that alternative? Who fits that description? Someone who can appeal to the majority? Well, Mark, thanks for having me on here. And the truth is we haven't begun to look at potential nominees because we're not sure if we're going to run a ticket just yet. Uh, there's no need to rehash the numbers and what we're seeing across this country. And that is the majority of Americans don't want to see this rematch between Trump and Biden. I mean, 70 percent do not want to see Biden run for re-election. 60 percent do not want to see Trump run. And so the question becomes, who's speaking for the common sense majority? And if these are the numbers and if these are our eventual nominees, uh, then Americans deserve a, a, a voice and a choice come next year. And that's what no labels is poised off of. It, no labels seems to imply that the labels themselves are toxic. What is it about the Democratic Party or the Republican Party that voters want to disassociate from? Look, I, I think that uh, it's no secret that everything is just uh, hypercharged in Washington, D.C., and the, the partisan divide has, has grown uh, further and further. And majority of Americans are somewhere near the middle, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. But we've seen in Washington, D.C. It has not been an accurate reflection of where majority of our country is right now. No, I'll just say No Labels has been a group that's been around for over 12 years, attempting to bridge that partisan divide and inject common sense ideas. And we're going to continue those efforts. Yeah, but only now, just uh, looking at this third party presidential bid, perhaps. Uh, you, you mentioned the word common sense. I see that term common sense all over the branding of the no labels third party, if, if, if we can call it that just yet. I guess that harkens back to Thomas Paine somewhat in American history. And, and back then in that pamphlet, there seemed to be a clear dividing line between society, commerce, things that society would do on its own, and then government, the things that government has to step in and regulate. Is that somehow inherent in this no labels push to for have government to do less but do it better? Yeah, look, everybody wants our government to operate more efficiently. And what you see in Washington, D.C., it's either uh, parties think that they either want they either get 100 percent of what they want or nothing at all. And so we continue to be just being a stalemate. And, uh, you know, no label is all about moving the ball down the field, uh, even incrementally. And uh, the, what we've put out in common sense is that even a lot of these, I guess, contentious issues, have a lot of common ground where the majority of Americans can stand. And just because we don't agree on everything doesn't mean we can't work together on anything. And I worked in the Problem Solvers Caucus when I was there and just two years was able to get two of my bills through a divided Congress and signed in law by President Trump. And you do that by reaching across the aisle and finding common ground. Uh, and again, in, these, in this book, Common Sense, we talk about everything from immigration, to our economy, to taxes, to women's reproductive health, to gun safety. And there's a lot of things that Democrats and Republicans can agree on. And we're just trying to ignite that debate uh, between two parties and show Washington, D.C. that outside the Beltway, a lot of us can agree on these things. It, it seems you're saying that there's a big middle path to the White House, perhaps. We'll see if that actually plays out. But there's a question about, one, who's your champion? We don't know who that person is yet. And two, maybe more importantly, how do you have trust around that person if we don't know how we're going to pick that person? How will no labels pick the candidate? If voters don't get to pick them in a primary, then why should anyone trust that voters would like them in a general? Look, we're still formalizing uh, that process. And the clear message right now is that Americans are not satisfied with the two choices they have, uh, both on the Democrat and Republican side. The majority 
you know, of Americans, like I said, are dissatisfied. And the polling indicates that there is a pathway for a unity ticket, a Democrat, Republican, or a Republican and Democrat. And if that continues, and if that pathway to victory is is open, uh, then we can nominate a ticket and, and move forward. But uh, we would only be entering the race to win it if the polling indicates that there is that clear pathway. Well, we, you talked about one Democrat, one Republican, but it's some people look at this and think you're, you're changing the rules in the middle of the game. If it's Democrats who you've said on the record, Democrats aren't offering an alternative who appeals to the majority, then shouldn't some Democrats step up and challenge Joe Biden and beat him in a primary? I mean, I think that a few people have already uh, attempted to do that. But as you know, the, you know, the power of the incumbency and with the establishment backing, uh, that, that generally just does not bode well. And again, whether or not it's the, the actual names of the parties or the, the names themselves, uh, the, the data and the polling is, is fairly clear that the majority of Americans are not happy with these two choices. And we have a constitutional right to secure ballot access in 50 states plus Washington, D.C., and provide Americans with another choice. Uh, so we're simply going about the work that is guaranteed to us in the Constitution. You know, the document that I that swore, uh, swore an oath to protect and defend as a member of Congress, and all members do that. Mm, certainly anybody can run, but uh, outcomes are, are important too. And historians may quibble some, but just looking at the hard math, you can certainly make a strong case that Ross Perot handed the 92 election to Bill Clinton or that Jill Stein and Gary Johnson together handed the 2016 election to Donald Trump. So why run that risk of playing spoiler? Well, let's take the, the last one first. Uh, you know, Jill Stein or Ralph Nader uh, were spoilers because they received a small fraction of the vote that ultimately had an impact. They're also far, far left candidates. Our candidate, our ticket, if we nominate one, would be a marquee level ticket that would not pull overwhelmingly from one side or another. In fact, our own internal data and polling shows that it pulls equally from Democrats and Republicans, as well as garnering a significant amount of independent uh, support. You know, you mentioned Ross Perot. I guess that may be the, the, the most comparable one, although it's not perfect. But the data from Ross Perot showed that it pulled evenly from Democrats and Republicans. I think 38 percent of people during an exit poll said that uh, if they hadn't voted for Ross Perot, they would vote for uh, the Democrat. 38 percent said Republican. And then the rest said they just would not have voted at all. Uh, so, you know, that that is more representative of the polling and data that we have. And the truth is, uh, you know, there's some polls out there. that shows that something like this would actually help Biden. So we don't really know. We're going off the best data that we have right now. But until if and until a ticket is nominated, will we understand exactly how the numbers will shake down? And we are an eternity away from 2024. So we have a lot of time left uh, to determine whether or not we're going to put a ticket together and run something. Which is the better long term structural reform to our political incentives? Uh, injecting this sort of long shot third party bid in the end to change the math or ranked choice voting? Look, there's a lot. Uh, I don't think it's either or. There's a lot of things that we can do to sh shore up our democracy, in my opinion. I mean, I'm here in South Carolina where we have straight ticket voting, uh, which you know is one question at the very top of the ballot that auto populates the rest of your ballot, depending on which party you select. And I view that as you know, state sponsored partisanship. Only five states in the country still do it. Um, you know, we have a lot of issues that 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 uh, that we need to be attacking and that will give voters more choices. Uh, but none of that's going to happen if we continue down the road we've been going down. Uh, and All right. what, no, what No Label is trying to do is provide people with more choices as an alternative. I hear you. He was a Democrat from South Carolina, that early voting state. Now he wants someone other than Joe Biden to be president. Congressman uh, C Cunningham, thank you for joining us. Well, well, I'm still, I, yeah, I still, I still, I'm still a Democrat here, uh, Mark. This is just well. I didn't want to. Yeah, I didn't want to remove you from the party, but you're back in this no labels thing. I guess that that's a label, isn't it, Democrat? I've been, I, I've been, I, no, I've been consistent. We have Democrats, Republicans, Independents, but this is a group of people who put their country first, who are willing to sit around a table with Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and you know, to tone down the divisive rhetoric, first of all, so that we can actually have a conversation. And this is a group of people who love their country more than anything. And, um, and I'm, I'm proud, to be, proud to be associated with them. All right. Well, thanks for the clarification. Still a Democrat, just rooting for someone other than Joe Biden. Thanks for having me, Mark. 
He won the Iowa caucuses in 1988 and ran for president again in 2004. He might be the Missouri politician to come closest to the White House since Harry Truman. Former Congressman Dick Gephardt is on the record. Congressman, you've you've come out with this new group, Citizens to Save Our Republic, to oppose this other third party push that would put an independent or bipartisan candidate forward as an alternative to Joe Biden or Donald Trump in 2024. I want to ask you this, though, the head of no labels says, why not give people a choice? Well, why not? Well, that makes a lot of sense. If, if you are, were in normal times, we're not in normal times. In 2020, we miss having a broken election by a whisker. The only reason we avoided a broken election was Mike Pence and five or six Republican election officials out in the swing states stood up against what overwhelming pressure from former President Trump to not do the right thing. They all put country over self and saved us from having a broken election. Now, the individual who tried to break the election and overthrow the federal government is a candidate again. All the polling you can look at indicates that if the two candidates of the parties are Trump and Biden in 2024, if you put in a no labels candidate, Donald Trump will be reelected. As Liz Cheney said, we cannot ever allow Donald Trump near the White House again. So in effect, in the person of Trump, you're going to have democracy on the ballot in 2024. That instance that you cite, January 6th, of course, happened after the 2020 election. So voters would go in knowing that information. And, and you, you alluded to polls, too. Uh, we know they're merely a snapshot in time. But for our viewers watching this and engaging in this discussion with us, this far away from next November, how could anyone be so confident that a third-party candidate would actually siphon more votes from Joe Biden than they would from Donald Trump, knowing what we know about him? Because if you look at history, no third-party candidate has won one electoral vote, one electoral college vote, except for George Wallace in 1968, who won a handful. You know from the 2020 election that a Biden-Trump race again would be razor-thin, close outcome. The polling that we've done recently indicates that if it's Biden and Trump, it will be a Biden victory by the same margin that he won by in 2020. And you have to remember the popular vote is no longer relevant to anything. You got to look at the electoral college vote. And that means you got to look at six or seven swing states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, whatever, mm -hmm. that really decide the election. So literally a million voters or less between six swing states will decide this election. They are independent, moderate voters. I understand their angst at having a replay of 20, 2020, but sometimes you don't get two good choices or even one good choice in life. You get two choices that you don't like very much, but you got to make a choice. And our well, well, worry- that, that assumes that the system we have is the system that we should have. No, it's the system we have. You can't change it. It's the electoral college system. And that's what we have in this fabulous democracy that we're all privileged to live in. It was put together in 1789. No label says we need a choice. Who's going to provide their choice? Are they going to have their candidates in primary elections by the people next spring as the Republicans and Democrats are? Who's going to pick their candidate? How are they going to pick their candidate? It, it makes no sense. We have a choice. We can go to primary and anybody can run for president. You know, mm -hmm. there are nine candidates against Donald Trump. There are no candidates yet against except for RFK Jr. and maybe Cornell West against Joe Biden. But Joe Biden is going to have to get through primary. So there's lots of choice on the ballot in all right. the states coming next year. So their argument just doesn't make sense. And a lot of this third party talk, frankly, at this stage is guesswork at the best. I, there's a guaranteed way to keep Donald Trump off the ballot. That's to help another Republican candidate win. 
Uh, you've said you're spending a lot of money on this uh, effort of yours on the third party. Are, are there any Republican candidates you could support instead of Donald Trump? Why not throw all of your energy into a campaign for Mike Pence or Tim Scott? Well, that's a good question, but the Republican Party has to figure out what they want. I'm a Democrat. I've always been a Democrat. I like Tim Scott, and I admire Mike Pence for standing up and doing the right thing and putting country over self. But that's a decision that has to be made by Republican voters in states all over the country, as just as Democratic voters have to make that choice. So if it comes out that there's a different, and, and w- no labels is said, if it's not Biden and Trump, we're not going to do this. Mm-hmm. Why don't they say that if Donald Trump is the Republican nominee, we're not going to do this because he is the only candidate out there who is a threat to having valid elections in this country. He's still maintaining today that the election was stolen in 2020. He has convinced millions of Americans that our electoral process is corrupt. If the people in this country decide they don't trust our electoral process, this democracy is over. That's what we face on the ballot in 2024. I want to get into some of that matchup question in a moment. But first, I'm curious about your effort. What is your battleground against no labels? Is it one of just public persuasion in media interviews like this or in advertisements? Uh, What will we see from your group as you look to engage this issue? We're going to continue messaging in any way that we can to try to convince the folks at No Labels to not go forward with this if Donald Trump is the nominee of the Republican Party. My worry, our worry, is that they're planning to have a convention to pick their candidates next year. Well, they're not going to know by then whether or not Donald Trump is the Republican nominee. They're not going to know for sure. So why wouldn't they just say we're going to hold off on doing anything until we find out what happens to Donald Trump in the Republican process? It could be that President Biden is also looking at that same uh, that same Republican convention and their nominating process as well. Depending on which poll you look at, nearly half or more than half of registered Democrats want someone other than Joe Biden to run for president. If that many Democrats don't want an incumbent president to run again, isn't that the source of his weakness and not some other third party? Well, look, if you look through history, when we're approaching a presidential primary election season, there are always people who say, we don't have any good choices here. I remember back when Jimmy Carter was running against Ronald Reagan in 1980. A lot of Democrats were saying, oh, why do we have to have Carter? Why can't we find somebody else? We're a country of 300 million people. Why can't we find better candidates? And we're always looking for the perfect human being to be president. We all know it's the toughest job in the world. And we're always looking for the perfect person. Well, there is no perfect person. We're all just human beings who do our best. Yes, there are Democrats who would like Joe Biden not to run. Joe Biden has to make that decision. Democracy requires good volunteers. If people are fed up with Joe Biden, then they ought to run in the Democratic primary. It's a free country. When I ran in 88 and 04, nobody in the party asked me to run or asked me not to run. It's an individual decision in a free country where we need good volunteers to be public servants. Would that be healthy? Would you like to see a primary challenge uh, from someone who has more of the blessing of the party uh, operation than maybe RFK or Cornell West? There is no party. There, There is no group of elites within a party, in either party, that blesses or doesn't bless candidates. The people choose the candidates, and that's as it should be. In 1789, our founders said they had a radical idea. They thought people could govern themselves. We didn't need a king or an emperor or a pharaoh. And we've been doing this for 250 years. But it requires people to make those choices and people to decide to volunteer to be public servant. Now, whether or not third party candidates swing elections, and we've seen some evidence that they can certainly do that, those candidates also definitely shape the message 
For example, I, I wonder, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, was Ross Perot right on NAFTA? Well, I agreed with him on NAFTA, and that's the way I voted in Congress. That's one of many, many issues. In truth, I think you can conclude that he really elected Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton only got 43% of the vote, and but he got enough electoral votes to be elected president. I think if Ross Perot had not been in the race, George H.W. Bush would have won re-election. And, and our polling, which we've done in the swing states and nationally, indicates that if a no-labels candidate, a centrist-type candidate, is in this race between Biden and Trump, Trump will win because Joe Biden depended on less than a million moderate voters in the swing states to vote for him instead of Trump. Those people could well and probably would go to a third party choice. You talked about the 92 election and Ross Perot. Perhaps a third party candidate uh, is a place for people unpleased with the incumbent to register their displeasure. Not sure about that. But I want to ask you about that time frame as well, because back then, back in the area when, when you ran for president, about one in 20 Americans, according to Pew Research, held an unfavorable view of both parties. Today, it's one in four Americans or more who hold an unfavorable view of both parties, approaching one in three. How much more divided can we get as a nation before we say maybe George Washington was right, that the political parties can destroy the country? The parties don't bless candidates. They don't make candidates be a candidate or not be a candidate. I think our system works well. I am worried, as you just said, that the American people are about, about as badly divided as they were in 1860. If half the people hate the other half and vice versa, you can't have a democracy. People complain to me that Congress is dysfunctional. I say, yeah, it kind of is. But don't blame Congress. Look at the American people. Congress is a reflection of the American people. If the people are bitterly divided, Congress is bitterly divided. Now, why are the people divided? <clears throat> I think there's one significant cause that wasn't present when I was in politics, and that is social media. You have to look at the business plan of the social media platforms. What is it? If you're on the platform, they know everything about you. So they boost to you 24 seven information to keep you angry, anxious and upset with whoever you think your possible enemies are. And that, I believe, is a significant cause of the division we see among the American people. When I was in Congress, I worked with Republicans every day. My best friend was Bob Doe, and we got things done. Compromise is always hard. It's always hard. But we got compromises done. They just can't do that today. Because if you compromise as a Democrat or a Republican, you get punished in the next election and you probably lose. Mm -hmm. So we've got to address the information culture in our country so that we can continue to have a democracy. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine Bob Dole on TikTok. I'm not sure what that would have looked like. Uh, you, you enjoyed, I want to ask you one last or question me. about, uh, yeah, or you. Uh, I want to ask you one last question about uh, messaging and the direction of the political parties. You enjoyed a lot of support from organized labor throughout your political career. Republicans are making an active play for labor right now, at least in message. Josh Hawley is one of them. He says the Republican Party is the party of the working class now. Certainly some data in recent elections does suggest there's something of a shift going on. What do you see changing there? Do you think Democrats are losing ground with labor? Well, first of all, labor unions have lost a lot of ground. Uh, it used to be that 20% plus of workers were in unions in the country. That's now less than 10%. So unions have been in decline, in my view, unfortunately, because I think they serve a needed purpose. My dad was a milk truck driver at Peedley Dairy. He was a teamster. Uh, he didn't have a high school education. And he used to say to me at the dinner table every night in South St. Louis, the only reason you have food on the table and clothes on your back is because I'm represented by a labor union that can get me fair wages for my hard work. Democrats make a mistake 
by not listening to these folks that we have left in unions in America, trying to understand their plight, their challenge, and helping them in the things that they need help on. One of the big issues is trade, international trade. And Democrats, unfortunately, have been part of the whole effort that's gone on for 40 or 50 years to open up America's market to unfettered what they call free trade, but it's not fair trade. And that was an issue I worked on my entire time in Congress. And I think Democrats have to make that an issue that they work on every day so that they have better messages and better performance for the people who have lost their jobs, especially in manufacturing in labor unions. Well, it's a fascinating conversation and one we hope to continue having with you as this process continues to transpire. But former Congressman and St. Louis statesman Dick Gephardt, thanks for joining us. That does it for us this week. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back here at the same time next Thursday. Until then, we're off the record.